Lord be with you. And welcome to this time of worship together on the first Sunday of Christmas. We pray God's blessing upon you during this Christmas season and are glad that you have chosen to join us in worship. We are Cedar Heights Community Presbyterian Church. Let me introduce those of us who are leading worship this day. Back in the back, Patty Foster is doing our PowerPoint. Randy Darst is bringing this to you in all the technological glory. Sue Feltman is providing the music for today, and the special music today is provided by Sue and Dave's son, Pete, all the way from the Bay Area in California. Pete Feltman is providing our special music. Leading worship today is Johnny Jansen, who will be leading the second half of the service, including our prayer time. And I'm Dave Kibbett. I'll be leaving, leading the first part and preaching today. A couple of announcements to share with you uh, this morning. Uh, first of all, to let you know, we're going to try something new in January. We want to have a Zoom meeting right after worship on Sunday, January 10th. January 10th is when we celebrate the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ, and it's when we ordain and install new elders and deacons, and we want you to be a part of that service. So the last part of that service, we're going to ask you to sign off of Facebook and go on to a Zoom link that we will send you, and it will be a Zoom meeting at the end as we install and ordain our officers on Sunday, January 10th. Also coming up after that on January 12th, we have been leading a Bible study together with the other Presbyterian churches in the Cedar Valley all the way through the Bible, from in the beginning all the way to the final amen of Revelation, and we finally made it to the New Testament. And so our course on the New Testament begins on Tuesday, January 12th. It's a Zoom meeting every Tuesday evening from 6 to a little after seven o'clock. We invite you to join us, even if you haven't been part of the journey so far, to join us for our journey through the New Testament. Uh, let one of your pastors know, either Pastor Johnny or myself, and we will get that recurring Zoom link to you so you can study God's Word in the New Testament together with us in the new year. So please join us for that. Let us now call ourselves to worship with these words from the hymn, Angels from the Realms of Glory. Angels from the realms of glory, wing your flight o'er all the earth. You who sang creation's story, now proclaim Messiah's birth. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. All creation join in praising God the Father, Spirit, Son, Evermore your voices raising to the eternal three in one. Come and worship. Come and worship. Worship Christ, the newborn King. So let us join together in our opening hymn, hymn number 132, Good Christian Friends Rejoice.
You know, the great thing about Sundays, about coming together to worship the living God, is a realization that Monday through Saturday, we tend to focus on how other people are getting it wrong. We're quick to find blame and point our fingers. But Sunday is a great reminder that if you're going to complain about something, start with yourself. Figure out where you have fallen short. Start with the person in the mirror. So as we come to a time of confession, I share with you a button I got from a weekday children's ministry called Logos. And the button says, you are a child of God, I'll treat you that way. You are a child of God, I'll treat you that way. So here's the question I'm going to encourage you to consider. How many times in the past few days or weeks have you thought of yourself as less than a child of God? How many times have you doubted your worth? And how many times in the past few days or weeks have you talked or thought about someone else as if they weren't a child of God? Let us go before God in silence and think of the times that we have fallen short of what it means to be children of God. Let us keep silence before God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Siblings in Christ, hear the good news. God sent God's own Son into the world to love us, to claim us in that love, to cleanse us with that love, to forgive us, redeem us, restore us. So friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and adopted into God's family. Oh, thanks for that love. Now grounded in grace, let us celebrate the peace we have received in Jesus Christ by sharing it with one another and with the whole world. The peace of Christ be with you. Now as we turn to hear God's word and Holy Scripture, let us first turn to God in prayer. Let us pray. Our Lord and our God, open us to your word that we might see our value, our value as children of God, not only our own, but that of our siblings. Help us to see what it means to be loved and included in God's own family. For this we ask in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our scripture lessons for today are a continuation of the second chapter of Luke. We hear the familiar words of shepherds and angels. And then shortly thereafter, just a verse later, we hear this story beginning in verse 22. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of two turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, this man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. 
For my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory of your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. And Simeon blessed him and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. Then as a widow to the age of 84, she never left the temple but worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. From that story of Jesus' dedication in the temple, we turn now to our second reading from Galatians, the fourth chapter, verses 4 through 7. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if then a child, then also an heir through God. Here ends our reading of God's holy word. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me invite the children together for our time together. The church hasn't been really all that busy lately, not with people coming in and out. And one part of the church hasn't seen much busyness at all, and that's the church elevator. So I went into the church elevator today just to, you know, keep it company. And there's a sign on the elevator that says, Capacity, 2,000. And sometimes you see signs like that in businesses, but it may not say Capacity, like 2,000, that means how many pounds can fit in the elevator. Like 10 of me would be a little too much in the elevator. Or it may say maximum capacity, the total number of people that can fit. And that makes sense. We need to be safe, especially these days. But do you know what the capacity is? The maximum occupancy of the number of people in God's family? You can't add it all up. There's always room for one more. We're all, each of us, anybody you can think of, adopted into God's family through Jesus Christ. And yes, that is way too many people to fit in the elevator, but there's no limit to the number of people that can fit into God's love and into God's family. We thank God for that. Let's have a prayer together. Lord, we thank you that we all fit. We may not all fit in one elevator or one room or one building, but we all fit, we all belong in your family. We thank you for that truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Vanquishing the gloom of night Heralding a wondrous birth 
God's own Son now comes to earth. Jesus Christ is born today, Christmas Day. From the angel shepherds heard the good tidings of his birth, and to Bethlehem they sped to behold his manger bed. Jesus Christ is born today, Christmas Day. Wise men saw the heavenly sign, journeyed far from Orient land, him their Lord and King to greet, offering treasures at his feet. Jesus Christ is born today, Christmas Day. Baby books. Do you have them for your kids? We have them for ours. Lots of people do. Those baby books feature all sorts of memories, a hand or footprint, first words, first visitors, grandparents, siblings, shepherds, maybe a list of baby gifts, diapers, onesies, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, I doubt they had baby books back then, but I have to wonder what Jesus' baby book would have looked like. A picture of the manger? Maybe a piece of straw? Certainly a mention of the shepherd's visit and what they shared about the angel's message to them. Our Bible features very few stories about Jesus' childhood. The Bible our Roman Catholic siblings use has more books. The Apocrypha is included. And there are several stories there from Jesus' childhood. But all we get from Luke is this. The well-known first half of Luke chapter 2. And then these not-so-familiar verses that follow right after those. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses... They brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what was stated in the law, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. There are not many pageants about these verses. No choirs of angels singing about Jesus' parents and how they raised their son. They followed the law of Moses. Like this purification ritual, which would have been set for 40 days after his birth. 
Luke actually combines two rituals here, the purification of the mother and the dedication of the child. He even mentions the offering. In this case, it is to turtle doves, the gift required for poor families. A greater sacrifice is usually required, one that includes a lamb. But for poor families, like on a sliding scale, it would just be these two birds. This would be the kind of event that parents would chronicle in their baby book, like we would with our child's baptism. Luke includes this story to show how the child is raised according to the law of Moses. This is one of the things that Luke is trying to communicate about who Jesus is. He is a faithful Jew. Luke wants us to know that Jesus was raised inside the faith. Luke also wants us to know how Jesus relates to outsiders. This will be the unique focus of Luke's gospel. He is the one who includes the story of the ultimate outsider, the supposedly good Samaritan. Luke will also chronicle the outreach to the Gentiles in Acts, because Luke wrote both. Volume 1, the Gospel according to Luke. Volume 2, the Acts of the Apostles. Both are very intentional about including outsiders. The ever-expanding circle of Jesus' reach begins early at the very beginning of his earthly life. I mean, think about it. Who has shepherds come and visit them after they're born? Then, when Jesus is dedicated in the temple, we have two stories of two more strangers, Simeon and Anna, reacting to this child and what his birth means. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory of your people Israel. Both of these people speak about the child, praising God. Simeon even holds him and picks him up. Anna praises God and speaks about the child who are, to all who are looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Both of these sure sound like very public acts. Now I know that people tend to lose their sense of perspective around pregnant women, and around children, especially babies. Strangers who would never dare approach otherwise somehow feel like they now have a license to approach that other person if that other person is a pregnant woman. Oh, what do you do? Can, can I touch? What? Or they do the same when parents have a young child, a baby. Oh, what a cute baby. Can I see? It happens. It happens especially when you have twins. Ask me. Ask any other parent of twins. It's like the twins are born with a sign that invites complete strangers to strike up a conversation with you and start asking questions. And my favorite one, as the father of boy-girl twins, is the numerous times I've been asked, are they, are they identical? Ah, okay. Got a little off track with the whole twin thing, but let's get back to the strangers and the baby thing. I think Luke includes these stories not only to see Jesus as a child raised in the Jewish faith, I think Luke includes these stories, and the story of the shepherds mentioned earlier includes them in the baby book to make sure that we know that God's love 
includes those strangers. Luke lets us know early on that this child is not just for one family, not just for one people. This child is for family and a friend and stranger. The broad embrace of Jesus and what his birth means is echoed not only in the fact that strangers herald who he is, first with manger, uh, shepherds in the manger, and then with these two people in the temple, it's in what they say about the child. Anna praises God and speaks about the child to all who are looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Simeon says he has seen the salvation God has prepared. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. How big this news is begins with Jesus' birth, and it gets even bigger from there. In our second lesson today from Galatians, Paul speaks about what Jesus' birth means and how its meaning gets much, much bigger. But when in the fullness of time has come, God sent his son born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. You see how far this has gone? From one family's baby book to shepherds to two strangers in the temple and now on to all of us. News so big and so broad that we are now all adopted into God's family. Through this child, born in a manger, dedicated in the temple early in life. Through this man, later in life, followed by a ragtag bunch of fishermen and tax collectors, later in life hung on a cross and risen from the dead, through him, through Jesus, we are all now beloved children of God. And not just children, but heirs. See what the birth of that one child can mean? How big it is. You know, I see the signs every year, and I know where they're coming from. You see them all over town. Keep Christ in Christmas. If that is the voice of frustration with how commercial our celebration of Christ's birth has really become, I hear you and I agree with you. That much I commend. But the phrase itself, keep Christ in Christmas, it, it's just off. It is terrible theology. We didn't put Christ in Christmas in the first place. And we can't keep him there. We can't, like Ricky Bobby and Talladega Knights, Will Ferrell's character, pray to little baby Jesus. No, Jesus has got to get out of the manger and on to ministry, to outreach. You see, it is through his life, his death, and his resurrection that we are all included in that one family. That we're all included in that one family. Now, I started the sermon talking about Anna and Simeon as strangers. Can I take that back now? Maybe make a substitution like they do in professional soccer, where the new player comes in, and the one who was replaced cannot come back into the game. I'd like to ditch the word stranger. Substitute neighbor instead. 
You see, my problem with the word stranger is that it implies that there is something strange about that other person. And that is neither helpful nor true. Quite the opposite. It is harmful. When we see someone else as a stranger, it allows us to see that other person as an other, or even worse, as less than. And that's not at all what happens through the ministry of Jesus Christ, through the ever-expanding outreach of Jesus' love. Jesus' love doesn't see that other person as an other. It sees them as a brother, as a sister, as a sibling, as a child of God. as a child of God. Our hymnal is packed with a lot of great hymnals, many of them familiar, many of them old favorites, many of them new favorites. One of my favorites is a communion hymn. It is hymn number 515. We're not going to sing it right now, but feel free to reference it if you have a hymnal at home, or if you want to look it up on YouTube, it's called I Come With Joy. I want you to hear these lyrics today as both a communion hymn and an after Christmas carol. I think it fits well with this passage from Galatians. These are the first three verses. I come with joy, a child of God, forgiven, loved, and free, the life of Jesus to recall in love laid down for me. I come with Christians far and near to find as all are fed, the new community of love in Christ, communion bread. As Christ breaks bread and bids us share, each proud division ends. The love that makes us, made us, makes us one, and strangers now are friends. Do you see how big and how broad Jesus' love is? The love that made us makes us one. And strangers now are friends. You see how big and how broad Jesus' love is? Do you feel his embrace? Embraced and included, not as a stranger, not even as a friend, but as family. As family. Jesus' embrace is that much bigger and better so much bigger than Bethlehem, so much bigger than any border. You see, Jesus doesn't belong to any people or place. Jesus doesn't belong to any one culture or country. Jesus doesn't belong to anyone. We all belong to and with him. Children adopted into God's very big family. That is the direction that Jesus leads us in. From cradle to cross, from and including strangers, supposed strangers, shepherds, and now siblings. The message is clear. We are children of God through God's love for us, through God's Son. That makes for a very, very big baby book on God's shelf. A book filled with lots and lots and lots of pictures, including yours and mine, ours and theirs, the whole family. Amen. Now let us join together in our middle hymn, as you do so as an affirmation of faith, if you will. Hymn number 146, Gentle Mary Laid Her Child.
Grace and peace to you, my friends, and blessings during this season of Christmas. We come before God in prayer this day, continuing our pattern of praying for the world one nation at a time. This particular first Sunday of Christmas, we're praying for Norfolk Island, due east of Australia and northwest of New Zealand. So we'll be keeping Norfolk Island and their people in our prayers this morning, as well as a number of concerns closer to home. Let us go before God in prayer. O Lord God, almighty creator of the heavens and the earth, who became incarnate in the person of Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, We lift up to you this day our cares and concerns, those doubts, those reservations, everything that is holding us back from serving you fully and faithfully. Lord, we lift up to you this day the people of Norfolk Island. Give thanks for that island's beauty and people and their culture. God, we pray for their tourism industry which, like so many nations, has suffered greatly because of the coronavirus. We pray for that industry, and we pray for their forests, their iconic Norfolk Island pines that have become uh, under attack because of climate change and certain invasive pests. Lord, we pray that that industry might continue. And we pray for the self-sufficiency of several other industries that are important to Norfolk Island. We pray for their beef industry, their poultry industry, and their egg industry as well. More closer to home, oh God, we, we lift up to you so many people who are, during this Christmas season, grieving and missing someone for the first time someone who was absent on Christmas morning, who would have been sitting on that couch, gathered around the Christmas tree. God, we pray for all those who are battling cancer as well. Pray for all those who are anticipating or recovering from surgery during this season. Lord, we lift up to you specifically this day, Sarah Corkery's friend, Julie whose cancer has spread and is now entering clinical trials. God, we pray for the fruitfulness of those clinical trials in Julie's life and in her battle with cancer. Lord, we lift up to you our dear friend, Lee Vermon, who is having exploratory surgery tomorrow to take some tissue from his lungs. We pray that uh, that exploratory surgery that is Thankfully, able to be done laparoscopically, we pray that that might be fruitful as well, and they might get down to the bottom of this, and figure out a pathway uh, for Lee. We pray for Lee and Hazel during this time. Lord, we lift up to you as well, Kate Hahn's son-in-law, Dom, who needs a new pacemaker and will have a heart catheterization procedure on Wednesday. Pray that, that that procedure might go well, go smoothly. We pray for Dom. We pray for Emma, Dom's wife. And we pray for their baby to arrive very soon. Lord, we lift up to you as well the community of Nashville, Tennessee. Pray for all those affected by that horrible recreational vehicle explosion on Christmas Day. Pray for all those who were hurt and affected. We pray for an end to all types of violence, O God, all types of terrorism. Lord, we lift up to you Lorena's grandfather, Bill, who's been struggling with standing and falling and has been recently hospitalized for that. that that, We pray that that hospital stay might be fruitful and that they might be able to get a handle on Bill's ability to stand and walk. We continue to lift up to you this weary world, O God, that is so weary 
of the coronavirus. We pray for our nation as well, our state, our specific community. We give thanks for two vaccines that are out there, and we pray for their distribution. Pray for smart plans to be put in place all around our country and globe to be able to get those vaccines first to those who need it most, but eventually soon and very soon to everyone else. We pray for upcoming New Year's celebrations, oh God. We pray for smart decisions to be made there as well in terms of curbing the spread of the coronavirus. Pray for so many whose lives have been affected by that virus, O oh Lord, so many who are grieving because of it. Over 330,000 families, to be exact. God, we lift up to you, your good servant, Bob Roof, who has recently contracted the coronavirus. We pray that he may only continue to experience mild symptoms. We give thanks for only mild symptoms thus far, but we pray for his full recovery, O oh Lord. We also pray for Sarah Corkery's father, who is back in the hospital, re-hospitalized because of the coronavirus, now suffering COVID pneumonia, as well as a bacterial infection. We pray for Sarah Corkery's father that he might fully recover from this. Pray for his care team. Pray for healthcare workers who are so tired, so exhausted, so afraid. God, we lift up to you, my own family. Pray for, pray for my aunt's family, Christine, who passed away yesterday after complications from the coronavirus after a years-long battle with Alzheimer's. Pray for her children. Pray for her sister and her brother, my father. Pray for them in their grief, O oh God, who know, like so many families, know that pain of not being able to say goodbye to someone. Lord, in this Christmas season, we give thanks to you, give glory to you for adopting us into your family. We give thanks to you, O oh God, for being our divine parent and primary caregiver. We pray that you might use the rest of our lives for your glory and that you might continue to raise us as your children pray this in the name of the newborn king, Jesus Christ, who didn't stay in the manger, but grew up and taught us how to love and to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now in response to everything that God has given us, let us worship God with our living and our giving, with our time, our talents, and our treasures. Please join us at home for our closing hymn. It is hymn number 136. Go, tell it on the mountain.
now as a forgiven and a forgiving people, now as children of God and siblings in Christ, I charge you to keep the faith, knowing full well it's the faith that keeps us. I charge you also to hear and heed the words of the prophet Micah. God has shown you what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God? So go now in peace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and evermore. Amen. Thank you.